Good morning. My name is Kenny Lee. I'm the pastor at Marvel and Lexa United Methodist Churches. On behalf of both of the congregations that I serve, we want to welcome you to this morning's virtual worship service. For all our friends out there in Facebook land, we're doing a Facebook Live this morning for the first time in quite some time. We hope that in the course of today's service that you will find a moment of peace, that you will have an encounter with Almighty God and that your life will be challenged as we go out to live a life of following our Lord Jesus Christ. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you before we begin our worship service. We will have drive-in worship today at 10 a.m. unless it rains, and you're able to listen to that service on FM 88.3 if you're in your car. Remember our daily devotionals, Monday through Friday, we post those both on Facebook, YouTube, and our church's website. Those are usually 18 to 22 minutes long now, a little bit more in-depth teaching a little, hopefully a little warmer and more personal. Don't forget to let Nina know if you're watching online. I will be participating in an ordination service today at 4 p.m. You can watch that on the conference Facebook page. I will be recognized as an associate member of the annual conference. Please let Nina know if you need an upper room. Let's begin our worship with the intro. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain that has watered the earth. We thank you, God, for your presence in our lives. We ask today, O oh God, that you would move in our midst, that the power of your Holy Spirit would lift up the troubled hearts among us. God, that you would allow us to find peace and rest in you. God, your Holy Spirit must move in our midst today or we will go away from this place 
feeling as though we're still dry as dust. God, open our hearts and minds to what it is you have to say to us today. Those things that you have prepared for us from the foundations of the earth. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn today is Rejoice, the Lord is King. Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh 
come to the time when we share the joys in our lives and also share our coming prayer concerns for the week before us. Of a particular joy of mine this week is that Laura did little damage in our area, although I did see some pictures of some corn that was down. My heart goes out to those farmers who potentially have lost a crop. It's a devastating loss for them. Our prayers are with them. My, my joy today is to be attending the ordination service in Little Rock with my wife, Miss Penny. Normally, ordination would be a communal affair where the entire annual conference would be present at, um, as we would be holy conferencing together this year because of COVID-19. That's going to be a, a much smaller, more intimate service. I'm still excited about participating in that today. That's going to mark a milestone in my ministerial journey. And on behalf of all of the mentors, all of the people that have prayed for me, my family, my friends, thank you for your love and support that helped me to get to this place. If you have a joy at home, I would encourage you right now to speak that aloud. Our prayer request this morning are as follows, that God would continue to protect us from the coronavirus. We pray for the unrest in the world and especially in our country. We want to offer up prayers for our church family, for schools, colleges, and universities, for our conference staff, our bishop, DSs, pastors, and laity, for those who have been unemployed during the pandemic. We offer up prayers for our law enforcement community, our medical personnel, first responders, for our leaders, local, state, and national. We pray for the victims of those affected by coronavirus. For Miss Bobby Von Cannell, Mickey Cox, Mary Blush, Donna Sue Smith, Brandon Bosnick, Kathy Rooks, Chad and Ashley Coleman and the girls, Levi Stringer, Ernie Smith, Sherry Lynn Kemmer, Jean Head, Phelan Cobb, Jesse Turner, Tim Thomas, Rochelle Wolf, Steve Burke, Dave Lee, Jim and Genevieve Faust, Clarence Guest, Peyton Gobber, Sharon Nuttall, Mary Ann Adams, Jody Cook, Mesa Kilpatrick, Stanley Bartlett, Louis Acock, Christy Davidson, Charles and Murtis Duffel, Gerald Parker, Bobby Steiner, Mildred Clatworthy, Ralph Clemens, Laura Dietz, Tammy and Addison Heidelberger, Karen Sipes, Olivia Coy, Katie Jacks, Hugh Jacks, Danny Vondren, Darlene Wooten, Courtney Turner, Luke Schaffhauser, Vivian Word, Scott Russell, Bridget Polk, Debbie Hayes, Glenn and Deb Hosey, Frankie Broom, Jimmy and Betty Davison, Larry Moeller, Gloria Higginbotham, Ruby Jean Turner, Gloria Treadway, Jimmy and Donna Allen, Amira Marshall, Ian Miller, Lee Scarborough, Doug Moreland, Drew Perkins, Richard Brady, Pam Catlett, Andrea Cavett Dillard, Gary and Sandy Henson, George Yonke, Raleigh Kate Haas, BJ Russell, Anna Marie Waddell, Charles Lushner, Lottie Potts, Jay Yarbrough, Stephanie Sanderlin, James Scaife, Estella Johnson, Levitris Thomas, Lawana Newsom, Leonard Franklin, Sandra Carlton, 
James Miller, Sherry Perkins, Jake Catalyst, Shannon Hinkle Stewart, Charlie Jones, Danette Walker, Sherry Moore Jones, Miranda Rocca, John Stroud, Dolores Jackson, Jane Guest, Trey Wallace, Carrie Simmons, Jimmy Oliphant, Van Cooper, Billy Moore, Sherry Tamanello, Alan and Pam Wildsuits, Kevin Forrester, Landon Jones, those on our continued prayer list. We offer prayers of thanksgiving that Kathy Harris Rook's surgery went well and she's at home recovering. The storms last week didn't do too much damage and that I will be able to attend the ordination service this morning. Would you join with me in prayers? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to gather here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We offer ourselves today as living sacrifices, holy, set apart for you, which is our rightful worship, O oh God. We come to you, Lord, knowing that we stand in need of your grace, each one of us. That with a thoughtless word or a careless act or a vagrant thought, we have sinned against you and you alone, O oh God. We pray that you would hear our confessions, that you would attend our prayers, O oh God, that you would offer us the grace that we so desire. Lord, we thank you for every good gift that you have given to us. We thank you for our life, our health, for our families, for our church community, for the place in which we reside, for this country where we enjoy so many freedoms. And yet we find ourselves, O oh God, in a troubling time as we fight not only a pandemic, but systemic racism. Lord, we along with all your people repent of our part in this. We would ask, O oh God, that you would teach us what it means to live in peace with one another. To show honor, mutual affection to all of God's children. To fight against injustice and inequality. To live as people who are free to follow Jesus Christ, people who are willing to confront the evils of this world. Lord, for those on our prayer list today who we've lifted up, you know every person. You know their bodily ailments. Lord, you know their spiritual needs. We pray that your Holy Spirit be poured out on them at their very point of need that their health would begin to improve, that whether you work miraculously, Lord, through the power of your Spirit, which we know that you can still do, or you use medications and therapies in our medical establishment, we just ask, God, that you would help us to make good decisions for our health and to do the right thing in order that we can live an abundant life while we walk this earth. Lord... For those who have lost a loved one during this time of pandemic, this time when we feel as though we've lost so much already and to lose someone that we love leaves a vacant space that, that seems impossible to fill. And we have not been able to celebrate their home going in the ways that we would want to. God, give us peace. Let us know the power of your presence. Comfort our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Lord, for those in this community who yet do not know Jesus Christ, we pray for their salvation, that they would turn their hearts and lives toward you, O oh God, and accept that offer, that gift that you offer to every human being that walks this earth. We, the children of God, offer you the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is during this time that we ask for your continued support of our ministries. Your offerings may be dropped by the water department, either during regular business hours or after hours. You can place those in the not depository. You can also mail those to Post Office Box 669 here in Marvel, Arkansas, 72366. If you have an offering you'd like to place with Lexi United Methodist Church, you can mail those to David, care of David Treadway, Post Office Box 22, Lexa, Arkansas, 72355. Let us sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we return to Paul's letter to the church in Rome. We're going to look at the 12th chapter. We will begin our reading with the 9th verse, but I want to read a couple of selected verses before we begin this morning's reading. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God is to distributed to each of you in our reading today. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, Faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living out of this word that we share today. Pardon me. Paul 
Paul describes for us in the 12th chapter of Romans what our appropriate position is in God's kingdom, how we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and how we're not to think too highly of ourselves. And then he goes on to give us a short course in what love and action would look like. Paul describes for us a cruciform life, a cross-shaped life. And as those cruciform lives are lived out, he he shows us what a cruciform church, a cross-shaped church would look like. Recall from our previous series in Romans that there was division in the church in Rome, that the emperor had sent the Jewish people away from Rome. They were, they were cast out, exiled from Rome for a number of years, leaving only the Gentile Christians. And then once the Jewish people came back in and tried to re-enter the church community, so much had changed and the Gentile people had probably let go of so much of the ritual of the Jewish people. And so there was conflict over uh, during this time of re-entry. And they were focused so much on their differences, they could not see how they were connected at the heart. And the unity of the body was affected during this time. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I've bemoaned the fate of our country, especially of late. There seems to be so much division among us You can choose an issue, any issue you want to choose. From health care to gun rights. Choose an issue and, and you will find that someone is a polar opposite. Someone who before we might consider to be a person of differing opinion, but now we might see that person who holds a different opinion than ours, especially in the political realm, as our enemy, as someone who's to be vilified at every opportunity, who's someone who is to be chastised with every chance that we get, that, that the media, the, which has become little more than a propaganda machine in my mind, in my eyes, is, is our means, our way that we can promote our particular platform. And we're already beginning to hear political rhetoric that is ramping up as we approach another election season. And very little do I hear about what each party is promoting in terms of what they are going to do for the American people, what their, what their plans to help our economy recover are, Instead, what we hear is how terrible the other side is. What, a, what an awful circumstance we're going to be living in if that particular side were to, were to win. And how we must vote for, for the side that I promote. We must win at all costs. And, and what, we've, what we've really kind of boiled things down to is what we're afraid of. And who is our enemy? Thanks be to God that we have the faith community, that we can be in a place where we can be persons of differing opinion, that we can sit on a committee, that we can attend a meeting, that we can be a part of a Sunday school class or a small group. And and though our opinions on particular points may differ, we can still be united as one body of Christ. We can still understand that our mission is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is trying to tell us and to teach us in the 12th chapter of his letter to the church in Rome. And and Paul reminds us that we are to hate not one another, not the other side, not the people that hold a differing opinion of us, but hate what is evil. In our baptismal covenant, we state 
that we are going to oppose evil in all of its forms. That is a broad sweeping statement. When we make that commitment, whether we stand up as a godparent for a child who's being baptized or whether we say those words for ourselves as we come into membership in the church or we receive baptism as a young person or as an adult, that is a big, bold statement that we are going to resist evil in all of its forms. We, the United Methodist Church, stand over against social injustice. We have tried to make positive steps during this time of So much tension in our country, so much racial unrest, where we see demonstrations, where we see people being looting and destroying property, where we see people confronting protesters with guns. We've seen a march on our nation's capital. We've seen peaceful protest and not so peaceful protest. And it seems as though our country is being torn apart, as though we're on the verge of civil war. And yet the church remains our one hope, our sure and certain foundation, that place where we can come together and worship God in spirit and in truth, where we can treat one another with mutual respect and love and care. One of the foundational bases for the church from the time of its inception is hospitality. People who were strangers, who saw someone in need, would bring them into their home, would feed them and offer them shelter, would offer them clothing, and as they did so, would be living embodiments, incarnations of God's amazing love and care for that person. And because of that, those, those radical displays of hospitality, the church began to grow because people were drawn to that. There were, there were no social service programs in first century Palestine and the Roman Empire. There were no, there were no SNAP benefits. There were no social security or SSI, there were no Medicare or Medicaid plans. People who were poor and sick and impoverished languished in hunger, lacked shelter, often died alone of diseases that could have easily been recovered from with a warm place to sleep an adequate amount of food, and adequate clothing. And the church began to be the social service program of of the Roman Empire. And one one of the officials in the Roman Empire who was engaged in persecuting the Christian church said to another official, the reason why we have so much trouble is they do things for our own citizens that the empire fails to do. When they meet a stranger who is hungry, they feed them. When they meet someone who needs shelter or lacks clothing, they offer them a place to stay. They give them the clothes off of their back. When someone is aged and is not able to support themselves, they take them into their own home and treat them as though they were their own family. Hospitality is at the center of who we are. And when we have people visit our church, and even during the pandemic, we have had visitors who have came to our church, who come to the parking lot and park in their car with their windows rolled down and their radio turned on, listening to our service, visiting with their friends in the community, and watching how God is working in our lives, hearing the stories of our testimony, the words of our prayer, hearing the gospel being proclaimed, and the way that they're attracted to our particular congregation is not only how we welcome and treat them, but is how we treat each other. 
Because when people see folks who are not related treat one another with mutual care and regard, with respect and true love, when they see the love and action in our hearts and in our faith community, people are drawn to that. They are drawn to that in 21st century Western culture just as, just as they were in 1st century Roman culture. And what if instead of vilifying our enemies, what if we begin to reach out to them what if those people who are not like us, who, who we don't share the same opinions with, what if we begin to offer them food when they're hungry? What if we begin to offer them a drink when they're thirsty? Or shelter when they're homeless? Or clothing when they lack adequate coverings for their body? What if we began to really be the church. There was so much concern just a few weeks ago that there were millions of Americans poised to be evicted from their homes and apartments and we were going to see a massive wave of homelessness. Thanks be to God, an executive order gave us a reprieve from that, gave people an opportunity to, to get back on their feet. Whatever we do moving forward, we have to understand that our positions and our decisions, not only as individuals, but certainly as, as governing entities, has the potential to affect large numbers of people. And yes, elderly and children are affected by those same decisions. We are encouraged by Paul to never repay evil for evil. We live in the United Methodist Church by three simple rules. Do no harm, do all the good we can, and stay in love with God. In one of, in one of those, John Wesley quotes this scripture, do not repay evil with evil. Allow God to be the judge. Allow God to take care of things. Because every one of us at some point in our lives have been an offensive presence to another human being. And if we who need God's mercy have been offensive, can we not find it in our hearts to allow God to be the person to judge the intent and the content of that person's heart? We must love God with sincerity, with truth. And, and sometimes people can be hard to love. Sometimes people that we live with can be our most challenging folks to love because we see them every day. We know that they leave their dirty clothes in the floor. We know that sometimes they fail to flush the toilet or we have to pick up from them after them incessantly or perhaps in the, in the case of myself and my son, when I'm trying to make a point, I belabor the point and repeat myself to the place where he just wants me to understand that he understands my position. We can all do a little bit better in choosing to love people, in showing our love, in being sincere in our love, in expressing that love to those people that we worship with. A cruciform life is love in action. A cruciform church is love in action. How are you showing God's love to another human being today? What kind of choices are you going to make as you leave this time of virtual worship and go out into the real world? Who are you going to see as an enemy and treat as a friend as a result of having heard this sermon? How are you going to change the way you interact with other people as a result of hearing God's word today? For those of us in the church, we are, we are called to treat one another with mutual respect, to put other people first, 
to never use our positions of leadership or influence in ways that would promote our own agenda, but to understand that God speaks to us through the gathered body of Christ, that we all have a role to play, that we none of us can do everything, but all of us should be doing something. We are called to be people who stand against injustice. We are called to be people who treat enemies as friends. We are called to be people who can show the love of God in action to God's world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we sing our final hymn, would you pray with me? Holy One, we have opened your word and been challenged to the core. We have come into this time to worship you, to bow our heads and our hearts before you, to acknowledge our need for a Savior, to acknowledge that we have much to learn, O oh God. That we often fail to be the people you have called us to be. That we find sometimes that being your love and action to the world can be one of the most challenging aspects of following Jesus. But Lord, your love has been shed abroad in our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. Remind us day by day, moment by moment, that that love resides in us not to be kept for ourselves, for our own comfort, but to share with the world that people might come to know Jesus Christ, to confront evil and injustice in all of its forms, to treat even those people who oppose us as people who are beloved in your sight. Give us your strength, O God, to do your will. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Our final hymn today is page 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Go from this place 
into a broken world to offer care to those who may not be like us, but are beloved by God. Go to be God's love and action to all the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen.